Hey, Lisa, thanks for coming on today. Thanks for the invitation, Tim. Okay, so, um, yeah, so I was going to start this by going into some of your work, and I think we could probably park that because that, you know, we could probably talk about that on another, in, an, on another, in another time, but, but Roe versus Wade incredible um incredible decision um and probably not unexpected for a lot of people um because it's been simmering there for so long uh just yeah how like how are you like how's your reaction to this whole bullshit situation I mean, I, th I think a couple of things. So obviously, anybody who's worked in reproductive justice knew this was coming. Everybody knew it would be the end of the Supreme Court term when they released it, right? So they could just sk sk you know, sk skitter off and not have to deal with the blowback. I think there are a couple of things that surprised me. One, Clarence Thomas's, um, you know, his own opinion that was very clear about saying that the path after Roe will be to overturn Griswold and um and Lawrence v Texas and Obergfell which of course are the contraception decision you know Griswold allowed married couples to have access to contraception um the Lawrence decision Lawrence versus Texas is about sodomy and the protection of sexual acts in the home among consenting adults and Obergfell is the decision that guaranteed gay marriage in the United States the fact that he laid it out so clearly um is I think was stunning and extremely helpful because it's very difficult to have plausible deniability about how the Dobbs decision and the erosion of Roe will lead to the erosion of all privacy rights. That is no longer possible. It's not possible to deny that that's the path. The second thing that surprised me is that there was absolutely no indication from the Biden administration that there would be an executive order after the fact. It was clear that the White House was caught flat footed, which was disappointing, but not surprising given the fact that the president is Catholic. But I do think that the immense blowback after the Dobbs decision Decision, recalibrated the White House's decision to move on Roe. And I think the executive order is a good first step. It's not enough, but it was stronger than I actually thought. I And in, in the last couple of days since the executive order, the Biden administration has come out to clarify, you know, the ways in which the federal government is going to enforce support for providers to be able to offer care, even in the trigger states, which has helped manage some of the confusion about the enforcement apparatus and about what, you know, what police departments and prosecutors can do for women who are seeking any kind of reproductive health care that might touch an abortion or other forms of care, right? So we have women across the South, especially, and in other trigger states that are being denied life-saving care about non-abortion related things like they have you know rheumatoid arthritis and they can't get methotrexate because it might actually induce you know an abortion if they're pregnant so i do think that the republicans have shown their hand that's very helpful in explaining to the american people and to the world about what the long-term and short-term goals are and i think the biden administration will move more swiftly you know to help solidify the federal government's stance on how to protect access to abortion care mm. and the, the whole the whole decision um uh coming only months out from the midterms itself has this sort of political yeah political layer that uh looks to uh it's just going to define this election really um yeah, it's, there's no doubt about it. it's going to be yeah. that and yeah. the the internal numbers like across the states are plus three to plus ten for the Democrats. Yeah. And that's all the way down the ballot. So in my state, Arkansas, which is a very conservative state right now because of gerrymandering, not necessarily because of the will of the people, has a plus seven for Democrats on Roe v. Wade. So I think that it will galvanize voters, it, whether regardless of their political party, actually, because so many women who are registered or affiliated with the Republican Party receive abortion care, mm. uh, that I think you're right, it will have a tremendous impact on on the midterms. Mm. And the people that, and the people that it's, uh, um, it affects, like disproportionately black women um, uh, across across the United States uh, in communities who probably thought, you know, this would never happen now. So y you've got um, people just in shock. And how uh, how f how for you uh, have you had a lot? Of, have you had feedback on the ground in in your because you're you're located in Arkansas? Like, how's it's a very conservative state. 
how is how's it been taken and do you do you feel as though there have been um conservatives who are like in a bit of shock as well because they're like yeah. I, I didn't sign up for this this is too far we've gone too far yeah i think that the republicans especially in our state legislatures um a they don't know anything about science b they don't know anything about reproductive health at all right so their scientific knowledge about reproduction is minimal um and so they don't actually understand like what an ectopic pregnancy is right they don't understand what endometriosis is so they actually had no so they've gotten a rude awakening and also they have been pressured by their partners and spouses and family members and communities in ways that are um more assertive than historically the case so i expect to see in Arkansas and across the trigger states um, that have strong grassroots um, ballot access. Like we have the strongest ballot initiative in Arkansas across the United States. So anybody could gather signatures and put an issue on the ballot in Arkansas to subvert the legislature, which of course is gerrymandered. So we will run a ballot initiative in Arkansas, I suspect next year after the midterms to guarantee uh, privacy access and marriage rights to all Arkansans. And you're going to see that in states that have, you know, stronger direct democracy. The ones that don't, you're not going to see it. And so they're going to have to do it in their own state legislatures. But yeah, I think the blowback has been very fierce and I think it will be sustained. So that's the thing, right? I think that the the Alito draft opinion, right, um, in, at the end of May, early June, that gave people a roadmap and helped them, prime them for what was going to happen. And so I think the rage will actually be quite sustainable. I mean, it's just such a um, an unprecedented revocation of rights that it's going to be impossible to forget it or to move past it. I don't think that that's going to happen. Yeah, it almost feels like... Uh you know, the, in the lead up to the 20, um, uh, up until the 2016 election, uh, really like you, you had this, uh, assumption and people being relaxed about, a, a Clinton victory and, and, and what it would mean. And then all of a sudden you have Trump and, and obviously he's a, he's a bit of a, he's a symptom. Um, he's the outcome of a, a, a broken system. Um, but is he, um, he's green lighted a lot of these things and it enabled it. Do you think it, the, the, the sort of shock of his presidency, um, uh, in a, like, it, I think we talked about it a bit before, before this, it having, I'm trying to put this in, in, in the right context that it's, it's awoken a lot of people like his presidency really shocked people into giving a shit about politics in some ways, but then this thing is just capped it off. And so do you feel as though there's been, um, something you haven't seen or read about in, in history, like really we're on the forefront of something that's really sparked, like the 60s, for example? No, this is not like the 60s at yeah. all. And as an expert on the 60s, yeah. this is that's not like was... that. <laughs> yeah. Nick, I will say that the parallel is that is the 70s, really. Nixon was very interested in an imperial presidency. He wanted control over foreign and domestic affairs. He felt um, a t total impunity, right, to break mm -hmm. in steel. And he used the, you know, FBI to wiretap, um, you know, so that part of the surveillance apparatus and the enforcement apparatus and the policing is similar, but the backlash is not similar. The way that the scale or scope of it is not similar. And mm. the thing that Trump had is like the infotainment PT Barnum authoritarianism, which was not at all Nixon style, like as a style thing, totally different as a media thing, totally different. And I think that, you know, this is a very accelerationist kind of public policy that's, you know, it's about time and about how fast things go. Mm. And the thing that Trump did is he accelerated this race to the bottom and emboldened a bunch of people who wanted the same thing. So the thing about, you know, the MAGA Republicans is that they want to break everything because in chaos, they can use fear and policing to gain control and compliance. And that was not Nixon's thing at all. Like he, he was an environmentalist, mm. you know, he, there were parts of his republicanism that would be absolutely foreign to americans right now yeah. as a party 
platform. But the temporality of it, the time of it, the timing of it, and the boldness of it is absolutely unprecedented. There's nothing like it in American history. And I think you'd be hard pressed to find something like that as a, as an infotainment, you know, sort of imperial presidency any, anywhere else on earth, quite frankly. Mm. You know, because it, it's not the kind of control of North Korea, right, where there is a, t- a totally closed feedback loop. It's not the kind of thing where it's a court jester, right, who's in charge, which is sort of how I see Boris Johnson. You know, it is not that sort of thing. But I do think that it exposed a bunch of generational chasms, right, in the United States as cohorts. And I think you're going to see the Trump administration, the January 6th insurrection coup, and the reversal of Roe as absolutely defining political moments for Generation Z that will fundamentally change their relationship to capital, to the environment, to labor rights, and to, to you know, human autonomy and freedom in ways that will radically reshape the globe, not just here, but elsewhere, because there's so much of the tendrils of the Trump administration and of mega conservatism that have like that are that have antecedents mm. right in so many other countries on earth it's not just the United States where this authoritarian stuff is happening it's happening all over the globe and also the pushback is happening successfully all over mm. the globe so you know, I think this is, if anything, if we could zoom out from the United States, we would see that this is a shift, not just in human potential and in capital and labor, but it's a huge shift in political consciousness. Mm. And that is something that might, might might have some connection to the 60s, but not quite in the same way. Mm. Well, also, the um, I was having a conversation the other day about um, with someone about how traditional sort of conservatives would use the economy as a way of winning elections and 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 their view of policy and now it's just resorting to some form of like culture wars to to spark or cheating or, and, or cheating gerrymandering or cheating i mean yeah. that's the thing they're going to try and steal the 2024 presidential election and a bunch of those state elections because mm-hmm. what's going to happen is the supreme court is going to in the united states is going to take up this north carolina decision and it's going to if they do that if they are able to do that with the nine sitting justices who are there right now they are going to basically say that every state can determine their own electoral outcomes and procedures it's going to be complete and total chaos and it will guarantee that the ruling party will get to choose all of the slate of electors so it will end two party rule in the united states so i you know we are it's both very heartening to me that there's been so much um outcry and activism i mean it, right next north north of Arkansas is Kansas, and they have 1,000% increase in voter registration because they have a ballot issue about a constitutional amendment to their constitution that enshrines the right to abortion and reproductive health care. So all of these new voters are coming out in Kansas to crush the movement to end abortion access there. So there is all this heartening news, right? And in some ways, it's great. And in some ways, it very well could be too little, too late. It's too soon to tell. But the Supreme Court is poised to end federal control of elections and Mm. federal control of regulation of any kind. So they ruled right after they ended Roe with Dobbs, they they ruled on this EPA decision, which is our Environmental Protection Agency, and basically said that the federal government doesn't have a right to regulate clean air or water. Mm. So they're going to come through and eviscerate all of our federal agencies and try and return powers back to the states, which would be absolutely devastating. Mm. So you know, we're not out of the woods, even though there there is some optimism that I have about the 2022 midterm elections. I think the next Supreme Court term is going to be outrageous. It starts in October. So, mm. you know, one thing that everybody's talking about here a lot, and I don't know how much you're seeing it in the news there, is whether or not the Biden administration after the midterms will rebalance our Supreme Court and move from nine justices to 13. Mm. When we started with nine, there were nine circuit courts. Now we have 13 circuit courts. The argument would be add the extra Supreme Court justices to the courts. I I think it's a compelling argument. I think that there will be more interest in it now because of Roe. Um, and I think it has to be done. Otherwise, the whole, the, everything else we're talking about is is not germane. You know, it won't be germane. There won't be federal there won't be federal influence. Yeah, it's it, it's absolutely shocking. And I think the um, uh, this talk of like, would there be a civil war in the United States or would there people take up arms and like you already saw it with the black lives matter movement in um uh, in portland where the police just stood back and let people shoot at each other like is that something that you see happening or 
is or do you think it be will become more of like a um, more of a more organized um you know uh fight back in a way in, if if it goes down the violent if if politics doesn't work do you think it will resort to a, that sort of prepping for some larger conflict i think what will happen if if the conservatives get their way on the court and federalism ends and it's all states rights all the time and every individual state can decide every single thing for themselves without federal enforcement i think that a all the elites will leave the south and the red states they'll flee they'll either go to blue states or they'll leave the country which will make it easier to consolidate power in those states B, the blue states are already banding together to create zones of care. So like Gavin Newsom, who is the governor of California, got together with the governors of Oregon and Washington. And right after Roe, they released this video. You should watch it. And um, where they pledged to create like this Western offense. I love it because it's football words about like reproductive health care. And they are going to create zones of access. And so what will happen is that the blue states who have all of the wealth, and have all the population will produce all of the rights and the red states who are i mean we only survive because we get federal subsidies right for they buy our food and price fix our food they subsidize oil in states like you know texas right they are subsidizing all the poor red states all of that money will dry up and this, the blue states will keep that money right because they're basically backdoor funding the south and they'll just get richer and richer and richer so will it be a fighting war i mean it will get hot in the red states insofar as the people are going to starve right and that's going to be compounded by climate change but it's going to be like we're going to go out and shoot people because we don't have bodily autonomy i think that remains to be seen i think it's much more likely that the hyper stratification of wealth will lead to i mean catastrophes of famine and starvation and resource wars i think it'll look like that because people won't have access to the things that the federal government had been able to provide previously and there won't be you know, ways to manage like health and human safety. I also think, you know, what is happening with Roe is a brain drain. So what what this chaos about reproductive rights and access to care does, it creates incentives for doctors to leave the trigger states in the red states and go elsewhere. So you're going to see, you know, in states like, you know, Georgia, uh, only 16 percent of the counties in Georgia have an OBGYN in them. So you're going to see all of these doctors and medical professionals and professionals of any kind leave because why would they stay? And so then that's going to create the grounds for chaos and it's going to be sort of vigilante stuff. So I would hope that it doesn't come to that. And honestly, the only backstop to that is corporate power. And I then I will just say that they do not have a sensibility about how fast it could get so bad for them. And there will be no respite. They will not be heralded, you know, as saviors by either side if they stood it out now. Yeah, I, I guess that sort of that corporate governance, um, uh, you know, like even donors to uh, uh, to the Republican Party would be going, oh shit, we're <laughs> like, this is going to totally reshape, uh, not like our customers or the people that we work with. Um, we, you know- The lifestyle that they yeah, have. Like yeah, if yeah. you're doctors, why would you stay? Yeah. I mean, it's it's unfair, and I they just can't think in that scale, right? They just don't. I think the corporate folks do not have the training to see how human systems move and work. That's not their job. They don't have that kind of political imaginary. They can't articulate it. They don't have people internal that can articulate it. They don't even have internal comms people that are helping reshape the way that the corporation thinks about things like climate or rights or justice. Really, even with you know the brutal murder of George Floyd and their D. EI statements and statements of racial accountability after, you know, the summer of 2020, they still don't have a sensibility about how police violence against black people in the United States is also the same as police violence against pregnant or pre-pregnant people now after Roe. So they don't have that, that linkage, like that's a new consciousness to them. And so they're reacting really slowly, which is to all of our detriment, quite frankly. Mm. And, and especially with, um, you know, um, basically authorizing, as you mentioned, vigilantes to go out there after women, um, passing laws to uh, stop them from it, uh, moving, moving, moving in states. Yeah, yeah. Like freedom of movement is um, fundamental rights, uh, and it's almost like it, they can't even, as you said, they can't even see it coming. So, 
how does um uh, as i said like you're an architect so how have you seen uh, just on the ground um it, can you see is there hope like is there hope there to 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 wind this back you know i know there's going to be a lot more bad things happen but do you think there is that hope to be able to change things I do. I do think, um, at least in Arkansas, like I said, our internal poll numbers are, are very, very strong, that the general population in Arkansas supports a woman's right to choose and supports reproductive health care for all. And right, like our internal numbers here, and it's similar across the South, people are moving to the left. The Overton window is actually moving a bit to the left. Um, but like the structural concern is really what the Supreme Court does with that North Carolina election case. And, you know, even if the Democrats win a couple seats in the Senate, which I absolutely think that they will, I think it's very likely that they retain control of the House. I think um, I think the next two years with a unified and larger Democratic majority could produce legislation that would be helpful. What do we do about the judiciary if we do not re- the Supreme Court, it, it won't matter, quite frankly, because that will be the end of two party, two party rules. So um, I think there are reasons to be optimistic and hopeful, but uh, ultimately it's going to take executive action to manage the, you know, the electoral crisis that will come. And I think that, you know, some of them understand it, but I don't know how seriously they all take that threat. I, I also think there's quite a bit of denial in the Biden White House about how bad it will be and how bad the Supreme Court decision will be on that uh, elections case. So um, it, that part remains to be seen. But I do think there's a lot of optimism about what's happening on the ground, for sure, across the South, but in all of the trigger states. Mm. And that expansion of the courts, um, I know Biden's, uh, he's been around well, since the 70s. Yeah, and yeah, t- yeah, t- forever. Yeah, forever. And his reluctance to expand the court. Um, I'm, I'm sure there are a lot of people like pushing him hard. Uh, do you think he would like? Is that something? Do you think he will do? I think he has to do it. So you know, one of those things is about what he thinks, and I'm not in the dude's head, right? So that's for the best, I'm sure. But on the other hand, it's about rhetorical style, and his style is to be understated so that the public pressure and cover gets to such a crescendo in the United States that it's easier for him to show that he's moved in response to the people's will. And I think that given the precarity of the democracy, that's not actually a terrible move, even though like my generation younger, I'm a Gen Xer, we would all prefer that he came out leading and swinging. I want all of the haymakers all the time, right? But um, I, that's not his style. That's not his generation style. That's probably not the style of the boomers that he needs to come along for the midterm election. So, you know, if I were his advisor, I don't know that I would warn him away from that rhetorical style on this particular thing. But I would be at least sending out some, you know, emissaries to help drum up support for court balancing. It's happening in the U.S. press. Some. It's certainly happening Uh, I think, in his cabinet. But I mean, like the law professors that I talk to on a regular basis are also in total denial. And the entire legal system in the United States is shifting. Basically, what the Dobbs decision said about Roe is that there is no legal precedent that, that the Supreme Court is bound to actually abide by. If there's no precedent, then everybody can make every ridiculous decision that they want. Every court can make make up whatever that they want. There's it's unhinged from reality or history or context or any any kind of legal scaffolding of of um, of I don't, of arguments about what should happen with the law. So, if that's the case, there it's only chaos. There's no there is no judiciary, right? So one of the conversations that's happening here is like, what is the law? What do courts do? What should they do? And I think the legal profession is in total freefall because how do you start back to school in the fall for U.S. universities and then teach criminal law? How do you teach constitutional law? It's all become completely untethered from history under this the auspices of like originalism and this other just like projected nonsense of the white men. So I, um, I, I think he has to understand the gravity of the situation. I don't know that I disagree with his rhetorical style about it, but I think it's a hard needle to thread because the party people and the left want a more aggressive stance. And I think that he feels hamstrung 
uh, by the political reality that he's in. So I don't envy that job. It's not like something I would ever want to do. But whether he's the man of the moment or not, I think history will decide. I, I, it's too soon to tell for me. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm sort of absor- uh, uh, observing like some races in, in Texas is going to be a big one like Be- uh, with Beto um, facing off with Abbott. Um, he's, he's, his approach has been pretty just confrontational. Like, cause I think there's an urgency there and he can see it and they want, they want, people want to see more of that. Um, yeah, but okay, Texas is like cowboy land. So you yeah. have to roll with cowboy style. There is not another rhetorical style available in Texas. It's not that's it. That's, it's a very tiny box of the way that you can produce a politics of the self. So he didn't have a choice to do that. Yeah. And if, if he goes, um, if Abbott goes, that would, I guess, be something, okay. yeah, a huge, huge it, would, it would be a huge shot in the arm. I mean, Texas would have some reproof, like right now. So it's summer in the United States and the heat down here in the South is like over a hundred degrees Fahrenheit, which is what, like 45 degrees Celsius. I don't know. My math sucks. So, you know how we do, we don't even use base 10, but that said, You know, their heating grid, the entire cooling grid and heating grid in Texas is failing. It's rolling blackouts. And it was like that this winter, too, when they had snow. So, like, their entire grid system is failing because they refuse to get on the federal grid where the feds could back them up with energy. And that, so so it's not just the lack of rights in Texas that's mobilizing to support Beto. It's also the energy grid, which is failing right now, and which also failed in the winter. And it's also the massive school shootings. And I don't know how much you know, coverage, the Uvalde massacre, you know, what play they got in Australia, but they just released the audio and, you know, they edited out the audio because of the children's screams as the police stood by and let, let him massacre like all of those kids in that classroom. And so, so many of the mass shootings, school shootings in particular have happened in Texas that it's, I think that that, that is at a breaking point there, whether it will turn the tide for Beto, I don't know, but I will say that more, and I have been part of the gun violence prevention movement for a very long time with folks in Texas. And I think that they are seeing much more support for gun violence prevention in a lot of different directions. I think Beto is in a position to, to capitalize on that. And Abbott is just a loathsome human being. So even his own party is tired of dealing with him at a national level. Level, and I think that that will help potentially turn the tide there. I think he has a better chance than ever Beto does of winning that that election. But I mean, Texas is Texas and Florida in the United States are basically ground zero for fascism, and Georgia is ground zero for election, you know, repression. And those are the those continue to be the three states to watch. And there are other places that are hot spots too, Wisconsin in particular for gerrymandering. But those three continue to be what I would watch if I were, you know, an international viewer curious about the twenty twenty two midterms in the United States. That's that's where it's going to happen. That's where the movement's going to be. Yeah, absolutely, and I we we have watched, um, yeah, shockingly, what seen the the shootings and the lack of you know any sort of response and and yeah. the complete politicization of of it just to win elections, the moral bankruptcy you know that you feel in your soul when you know that kids have been sh- killed. Um, I and I did I saw that footage of the police just meandering around the the hallways while all that was going on, and. I, you know, we've, we, we passed laws here in Australia to get rid of gun violence. Mm -hmm. Um, well, it's still, there's still gun violence, but to get rid of assault weapons and, and it just was, and it was done by a conservative government. Um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. I guess it's that the constitutional, the twisting of what that is and what it means is, is the main reason for that. But that, I guess that even before the Roe versus Wade decision, that that was another factor that's going to play big this year. So, yeah, I mean, the point is to flood the U.S. with guns so that regular people can shoot pregnant people and, you know, trans people. And in the United States, if you're pregnant, you're most likely to die by homicide and it's going to be a gun. So the number, so now we're going to make more pregnant people and flood more guns onto the streets. That's, that is the world that the MAGA GOP are ushering into the United States. And, you know, I think people are waking up to that being the reality and are horrified by it. What they end up doing with that realization remains to be seen, but the goal is to create that kind of chaos and to, and to 
really funnel money into the weapons manufacturers. So it's not just that we have a Second Amendment that allows the right to bear arms and to have a well-regulated militia, which obviously is not what this is, but it's the fact that the U.S. is the largest producer of small arms on earth and we export them everywhere. So we are the largest gun manufacturing center on earth. So, you know, the people who are buying those politicians are the gun manufacturers. So it's not, a, it's not a persuasive issue. It's not a question of, do you not understand what you're doing? They're like, these people finance my campaign. I absolutely do know what I'm doing. So you know, the corollary in the United States is we don't have publicly funded elections. So if we did, then this shit would stop. But we don't. Instead, we let all these yahoos buy out their politicians and the corporations buy out their corporations you know, and their politicians and the corporations then are basically you know proxy voters, right? So we have to have campaign finance for that to be changed. Yeah, absolutely. And- I think um, that's, yeah, that's one thing we're in Australia, we're, sh- we're shifting, uh, we're, we're in this battle right now where uh, we've got a conservative side of politics that want Australia to be like America. They, they're yes. trying to, they're trying to wind, wind back public health care and, you know, and, and the, they thought that we had a recent federal election where they fought on cultural war issues, like the, the trans issues, the, you know, yep. and everything else. And, and then failing to recognize that, you know, um, we have women dying every week, every day from um, domestic violence and abuse. Uh, and they're trying to wind back the clock to this sort of 1950s style um, yeah. w- fictitious world. Um, how, like, how, do you, how do you see, uh, how, how do you see that vision that they used to portray of that sort of world is that still something that they cling on to is it just like okay all bets are off we're just going to try and gain power at any cost now and we're not even going to try and provide that sort of vision of what america we think should be well one thing is that that you know one of the reasons why i said yes to chat with you is because obviously the us and britain and australia have these colonial imaginaries that they're constantly operationalizing and they hinge on demonizing racial others and sexual others like that's how authoritarianism and fascism work that's how colonialism has always worked and that's how the white imaginary works of the colonizer and so you know on the one hand those narratives are easily accessible because they're such a permanent part of of our, all of our histories, right, in terms of the national imaginary. And on the other hand, the conservatives lack their own imagination. So they find a lot of rhetorical power in nostalgia and fear. And the, the difference is that for the liberals in all of those places, the liberals are like into nuance and they want debate and they believe in like managerial politics. And so when they're confronted with the fear and nostalgia, they can't clash with it in ways that are meaningful for the folks that are on the conservative side. So it takes really huge shifts and breaks in the political, you know, world for them to be jostled out of their fidelity to this like nostalgia and fear politics. So in the United States, that's happening. I mean, mean, anecdotally, right? People are constantly coming up to me and they're like, I changed my voter registration from Republican. Like, I'm not going to vote for Trump candidates in 2022 or 24. Like, I'm so sorry that I did that. Like, I can't, this is not reasonable. I had no idea how bad the corruption was, blah, blah, blah. And so, you know, they have these mea culpas and confessions about their fidelity to that worldview because it was comfortable. And white people want comfort. They want cognitive comfort. They do not want to take cognitive risks about their identity. They want to feel like um, everything is stable and and predictable. And I mean, you can look at so much science about that cross-culturally, interculturally, about which countries' identities are predicated upon risk management and which ones decrease uncertainty as much as possible. The U.S. is very averse to uncertainty. So for the white voter, they want something that's familiar. They want the 1950s thing because they've seen it regurgitated to them constantly since then. And that's why Trump ran on the same slogan that Reagan did in 84 make America great again. That was Reagan's slogan in 84. So they want that regurgitation of the 50s whiteness because they want they wanted that to be their truth, even though it was a fiction even then. Thank you. That was a long rant. No, no, it's uh, fascinating because um, I listened to um, uh, another interview that you did and you were talking about a unit that you taught about Reaganism and um, oh, yeah. A whole and, seminar, and I could talk about Reagan all day long. <laughs> yeah, which is, which is quite um, 
you know, and which I find really fascinating here in Australia because we had in, well, Britain um, had Thatcher take power, Reagan in America, we had a Labor Party that was progressive. They did do some neoliberal things. They, you know, privatized the National Bank and, and did a few things like that. But but I think in, ter- in regards to, we sort of dodged a bullet in Australia big time because of the sort of the, that ideological um, sort of difference. But, but just to... This, this, the sort of hero worship of Reagan in the United States, like how to, yeah. And, and that sort of quelled a lot of the gains or some games that were made out of the 1960s because there was a guy who came along and just said, we're going to just, you know, we need to have this smile and slick look. Um, I know that's pretty uh, artificial, but, um, but it, <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. But, he, but his impact has, has been so great. And um, I think, that's a pretty good segue to to your work. Like you grew up in the United States throughout that time, and you know, family and friends. What um, where did you grow up? Like, what part of the states? Did you how did you end up in Arkansas? <laughs> I grew up in Northeast Ohio. Yeah. Um, in a big Catholic steel family. Um, my mom's family were French and German Catholics. My dad was Irish Catholic. Um. I- yeah. So, so, you know, I grew up in a different kind of clannish, like family politics than the South, um, with a huge, huge, huge family. Most of them were Republican. Most of them are not now. Um, and I, so my political career started when I was 15 and I started working on campaigns, but the only campaigns that were to work on were Republicans. There were, there were no leftists or liberals anywhere where I grew up. And so I went to college in the University of Pittsburgh, which is in Pennsylvania, which is right next door to Ohio. And then I did my graduate work at the University of Maryland on the East Coast. And so I spent almost a decade in the Beltway there, um, and, you know, in, in D.C. and taught at George Washington University before I came to Arkansas. And so honestly, I was, you know, when I came out, I, it was right before the Bush bubble burst. Right. And so there were still academic jobs like higher ed was still received a lot of federal funding and there were a lot of jobs when I came in on the market and I was doing race and gender work, which was very new and in my, and certainly in the field of communication. And so there was a lot of interest in me and I chose this job because Arkansas was blue then. And we have a balanced budget amendment that you can't do deficit spending. So it seemed like it would be very comfortable to come and do, you know, civil rights, political work in the South. And then, you know, I was here for about six years and then the Koch brothers and their empire in, in, in the in the Midwest bought our legislature and flipped it from entirely blue to entirely red. And so working with um, Gen X Republicans through that shift was very interesting because they were horrified. The young Republicans were very horrified at that shift and the kind of ideological compromises they were going to have to have. And so we passed Medicaid expansion in Arkansas with a Republican majority in our state legislature and did, I mean, all kinds of really fun things despite that shift because of the generational composition of the legislature. But subsequently, it's become older and whiter and more male and certainly much more conservative. So we've got a bunch of the sort of Tea Party, MAGA, Turning Point USA, old boomers now in the legislature that bought those seats. So I ended up here because they made a great offer and they have been, you know, the University of Arkansas has been very supportive of me. It's been a very good place um, for me personally. Um, because it's a laboratory in a, in a way that other states are not. It's so small and so under resourced that there are, there are different networks of possibility here that I would not have had access to anywhere else. Certainly, as a twenty six year old PhD Yankee, you know. Yeah, it seems to be the front of of everything. Like it's in the mix of, it. and and someone who studies history and, and you've written books, it must be <laughs> surreal. It must be surreal watching it. Um, unfold um the way that it has sorry it's just disconnected yeah yeah it um i don't know that it's been surreal i think i think that my memoirs are going to be crazy like if we had time for me to tell you about what it's like to be here what it's like for Bill Clinton to keep coming back here and be in the political scene. That's super weird. You know, the racial politics here are super weird because it wasn't a free state, but it didn't have these huge, huge wealthy plantations. So there's tons of ambivalence, but also desegregation ends at Central High and Little Rock. So 
the segregationist impulse at mid-century was so strong, but also the Western part of Arkansas it was the gateway to the entire American West. And, you know, like the, the Trail of Tears runs right through my campus. So there's an indigenous history here that makes things very complicated in terms of the racial terrain. And also Walmart is headquartered here. So like in terms of global capital and neoliberalism, like we are ground zero for that. It's, it's a very fascinating place. Um, it's a very fascinating place to work in politics, you know, as an intellectual and as an activist. Yeah, and and that's sort of with your first book, um, which uh, the looking at prisons and how they've impacted, um, how that's influenced America and so forth. How did you? Was that something you always had a fascination in, in when you moved to Arkansas? Was that something that you was on your mind and you were going to teach that, or was that something that just sort of came out of like witnessing what what was happening and unfolding so i started as a cold war scholar actually as an undergraduate student and i went to a program maryland was really known for cold war scholars and so that so i teach a lot of cold war history and rhetoric now still um but i also wanted to do race work so i sort of joke that easy e was my midwife because i'm of the hip-hop generation and so most of my political consciousness absolutely did not come from my parents it came from music and i and i found in early especially west coast rap music uh lens for understanding po the poverty that i grew up in and the you know sexual politics of family life and the understanding rural versus urban resourcing and so that to me was it was important for me to to talk about that because i think i obviously i was not alone in understanding how 1980s rap music really reshaped um politics and our understanding of reagan so i wrote my dissertation um prison power is based on my dissertation and so that's what i worked on you know as a doctoral student and i turned it into a book and um and living here in Arkansas now and understanding how the prisons in Arkansas were designed on plantations to rehouse black former slaves so that they could be forced to produce wealth for the state and stay out of the labor market and turn a profit um, was, you know, consonant with the work that I had done as a graduate student. So I have done a lot of work with D. Carter serrating Arkansas and trying to change the way that prisons operate here because it's just so horrific and it's almost all property crimes and drugs, you know, and those folks should be reenfranchised and they should be, you know, out in the public, uh, you know, living their best lives. Yeah, absolutely. And that, um, um, that's something that we've had here. We've had issues with, um, coming to terms with our past of putting, um, first nations people in prison over fines, yes. um, and just the yeah. complete injustices within the communities here. And, um, you know, we got a, we have this uh, company called um, they private they they attempted to privatize the prisons here too. You know, and and yeah. that's and and signing long term like twenty five year contracts with these people that don't give a shit about rehabilitation. You know, um, and it, it never stops that cycle of poverty or all the crime and um, yeah, that that's why I thought it was like really fascinating. And what and and when you led into looking at your next book, the um, your second book, Black Feelings, Race and Effect in the Long in the Long Sixties, um, was the going from prisons to that. Was that a bit of was there a link there, or is that just something that you sort of moved on to? Yeah, I mean, so so prison power got shit on by mm. so many white reviewers, and they wanted yeah. to stop the publication of it. And so, it, I mean, it was really frustratingly sexist and racist. My the reviews of that book, and then it yeah. ended up winning the national. Board yeah. in communication. So, you know, that was really frustrating. And so in some ways, it started as a, a comment to a reviewer of prison power, Black Feelings did. And then it turned into a three page response letter after the rejection of prison power. And then it turned into chapter four of, of you know, Black Feelings. So it started as a fuck you to the reviewers who are like, you know, Black people don't speak and their speech isn't political and their autobiographies don't matter and, mm. you know, riots are violence and, you know, there is no space for critical reflection on Black leadership in the 60s and 70s in the field. And, and so really, you know, 
It was about understanding how white people produced a black subject that was volatile and had all these emotions and no rationality when really it's white feelings that are determining all of the over policing and surveillance and brutality and lynching and you know, paranoia and emotional projection onto black people and their ideas. So, you know, it was a sort of meta response to my overly white field of study mm -hmm. and the way that they would not take black subjectivity or black politics seriously. And so, yeah, they were at, intimately connected. <laughs> and I've got a, I'm finishing a third book that will be yeah. the triptych. It will be a three book triptych. Um, that's about intimacy and about the way in which white voyeurism of black social movement activism produced these weird intimacies through surveillance and dominance and lynching. Mm. So, yeah, I've been in that space for about 15 years, you know? Yeah, it's unreal. I did I did read, like, <laughs> the, yeah, pushback and, and people and, and people being supportive of it and, and everything. How, how did people take your recent book like how was was that taken was there a pushback from the same people that tried to um discredit you in the with the first one no there was an intervening event in my field where we had um, a journal editor and a series editor book series editor who wrote this hugely racist and transphobic screed and he sent it to me and a bunch of people in the field and he felt like he was right and he's like send this to everybody you know and you know so a couple of us got together and he was no longer in charge of those things and it was it created a huge shift in the field and a bunch of scholarship was produced and a new mm -hmm. journal was formed and two new book series were born and so no the, the my field the field of communication shifted tremendously um and so then right after that then black feelings came out so mm -hmm. i think the, the only pushback that i've really received is from people who um who just generally object to white people studying, you know, non-white historical topics. Mm. And you're always going to have that, right? There's always going to be a, you know, a diversity of opinions on that. But mm. Mm, I'm always reminded of this historian, Darlene Hart Clark Hines, and she would say, if, if white people don't do black history, how are they going to understand it, right? And so, you know, you can't stop people from studying topics. They just have to do it in ethical ways that are good faith. And so mm. I'm hopeful that I've been able to produce a model of my career at this point, even though I'm, I'm pretty young in my career, mm. where people can do ethical work. Like I'm not a dilettante and I'm not dabbling. I've been in this world, both in the physical material world and in the academic world for my entire life. So this is what my political commitment is and people can like that or not like that but at the end of the day certainly my commitment can't be questioned you know what i'm saying yeah absolutely and i what i what i did think about is uh, you released the book in 2020 um and having the gop make uh the curriculum uh front and center of you know <laughs> yeah. them, them attacking it and 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 you and <laughs> the stories that you're telling um, and the reflections that you're making on the history of, of America, have you um, been under any pressure in that way or has it come under any scrutiny um, because of that, you know, that federal sort of pressure? No, and I don't know that it will come. Time yeah. will tell in the spring. I think, um, I think it's very likely that Sarah Huckabee Sanders will be the new governor of Arkansas, but um, I don't know that she has the taste for that. She's going to be tapped to be Trump's VP. It's pretty well known that that's the yeah. plan. If he runs, that she'll be the VP. So I I don't I don't think I'm going to get that. And, mm. I, and part of it is because I have such good relationships on both aisles of a lot of the Arkansas establishment who wants a different future for Arkansas. Mm -hmm. And part of it is that they are so arrogant that they don't pay attention to teachers. So, you know, part of it is de jure and part of it's de facto. But I think uh, I have been unscathed about the CRT debates and mm -hmm. have been able to take up quite a bit of space inside of Arkansas about race curriculum in ways that uh, a lot of my colleagues around the country absolutely cannot because they will be individually targeted. But that's just not the relationship between, you know, myself and the people who make decisions in the state because it is such a different laboratory for democracy there is more room to maneuver here there's more space to build consensus and to change and it's not that way in iowa it's not that way in texas and it's not that way in florida it's not that way in alabama and mississippi so um i feel grateful to have that space and it's mm -hmm. i think produced dividends but i have not had to face that kind of blowback mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Well, it's it is fascinating, and um, yeah, I you know I I, I really want to like we need another session to, because I really want to sure. unpick, I want I want to unpick that book because I think it's it's quite important because when I was um, growing up, I grew up in sort of a sort of state housing and things weren't always mm-hmm. great, you know, a single parent. Um, but there's one thing that really um, got me thinking about my place in society was looking back at the 60s and, and looking at social movements in America uh, and, you know, how, you know, of course, like Martin Luther King and, and different players in at that time and how, uh, you know, and that's why I think at the beginning of this interview, I asked the question about... Um, is the is is it tied back to the 60s in some way um what's happening now and um yeah that's that's probably why i'm trying to dig into that (laughs) you know i mean it's the unfinished business of the 60s and it's the unfinished business of reconstruction you know when we talk about the 60s and i talk about this in um black feelings we talk about the long 60s right so that's like 54 55 which is brown versus board of education which desegregated public education in the u.s to 75 which is the fall of saigon so that is sort of the 60s or 54 to 75 i was born in 78 so the 60s for me are not far away right they were hyper present for me they were a part of my parents like generation my parents are boomers like the music, the politics, the ideas were part of my childhood in a way that was hyper present. So um, for me, it doesn't feel like this historical move so much as it feels like very contemporaneous to the my youth, you know. And as a poor kid growing up in Reagan's America, I couldn't help but think that he was just a total fucking fraud. I mean, I voted for like Dukakis in my mock fifth grade election. I'm like, this is good. Like, we don't want H.W. Bush. Nobody wants this shit. So I have always had skepticism about Reagan in a way that I think like my parents did not. And a lot of their peers did not, even though they would have considered themselves hippies. They were also Reagan Democrats. So I think for me, there's no way to understand my political trajectory or my intellectual trajectory without understanding the unfinished business of the 60s and the unfulfilled promises of the 60s and the reversal of, you know, the boomer generation to fall in line with capital and with Reagan and with global dominance and with, you know, U.S. expansion and nuclearism and, you know, all the other trash things that the 80s produced. So I don't know that I can escape it. For me, it feels hyper present and like completely constitutive of the way that I see the world, Mm. you know. And do you think that um, sort of project Reagan started in the 80s is sort of just coming to some sort of unwinding right now? Absolutely. Well, it's both. It's unwinding and it's coming to fruition, right? So in some when I feel optimistic about politics in the U.S. and abroad as it's become more authoritarianism and, and reconstituted itself as more colonial, I think, OK, they, these are the, the dogs that caught the car. Like we're about to run them the fuck over. The whiz, now you caught it. Now we all are here. We see what you're doing and this is not workable. And when I feel optimistic, I feel that way. And when I feel not optimistic about political possibility, then I'm like, oh, this is there's so many people on board with this that just want to punish trans people and queer people and women and black people and indigenous people. And like these are just bloodthirsty monsters. So I toggle back and forth, you know, within a moment on both those, both of them are true at the same time. What do you do when your country is constituted by all of these bloodthirsty homicidal maniacs? It is exhausting and it's very difficult. I mean, and so, you know, the school shootings are are evidence of that in a way that the over policing is evidence of that. And the way that we're watching COVID kill in minority communities all around the globe is evidence of that. And so, you know, it's a convergence. We're seeing a moment of historical convergence that is so fucking profound that I think people cannot even they don't have the vocabulary or the community to process the amount of trauma that we are living through at this moment so i find a lot of you know solidarity in podcasting and lecturing and you know online discussion because i think we need more interlocutors that can help people to process the trauma that we're living through because it is so profound Mm. yeah absolutely and when COVID did hit i um and we sort of got a grasp of how big it would be and how it would impact everything. I wasn't surprised. <laughs> I just, for some reason, I wasn't surprised at all that, you know, we have this 
Trump person in the White House right. who represents everything that is the excess, the worst, the demonization of people. And then all of a sudden he gets confronted with a crisis which is bigger than any president in you know recent memory. Um, and then they've got to deal with it. And I just thought to myself, it was almost like it was meant to be in a really, you know, that's, yes. that's the teetering between the, the positive and the negative because we had all the climate strikes in the 2019 and we go, we're going to get some action on climate right. change. We're going to confront some of the issues that we've had. And then COVID hits. And then a total mismanagement of that. And yeah, so I just was not surprised for some reason. I mean, the thing about yeah. it is that this level of trauma requires a nascent new consciousness, political, social, economic, emotional consciousness. And the fact of the matter is that the United States, in my opinion, is only really 60 years old. We were really born in the Voting Rights Act of 1965. So we are young and politically immature and like, I mean, just ridiculous. And so we don't have this long legacy as a nation, right, of, of complicated, nuanced, sensible norms. Now, the people who lived here before, you know, it was colonized did. The Iroquois Confederacy is the basis of democracy on earth. There were the peoples, you know, the indigenous peoples of the United States did have this, but the colonizers and what the nation is now does not. And so we are held captive by a lack of political imagination in the United States that is due to our youth, you know, and our just unregulated capital. And so until that, that shifts in a tremendous way, the likelihood of shitty, immature political decisions will continue. But this is forcing people's hands. And I think we're long overdue for this kind of reckoning about what what a political consciousness looks like in this hyper global world with such, you know, catastrophe on the doorstep. So, uh, you know, I agree with you. I feel the same way that it feels it feels you know, sort of supernatural in some way because it is so giant and so complex and is reordering so much of society in ways that are both, you know, positive and progressive and also tremendously regressive that it's hard to hold it all in your head at one time, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I, um, yeah, I totally get that feeling. And, you know, I, um, I sometimes I just try and switch off, put music on and, you know, try and hide from it. But I think, um, you know, we're, we're close to finishing up, but I, I, I really do appreciate this conversation because it's covered, we've covered a lot of ground, but I, even today I had someone who's active in the climate movement say, you know, you know, why, why, I don't know whether I can keep going, you know, um, and, and keep fighting this because it just seems like there's all, always roadblocks, even with the allies, of, uh, there are roadblocks. So mm -hmm. um, if, you know, for you, how do you, how do you switch off? How do you re recharge yourself? Like is if, yeah. if you had something, if you had any advice, how would you, what would you give? It's not a good time for that question, Tim. So, I mean, I'm like, so bright. Isn't everybody just so totally fucking burnt out? Yeah, sorry. I'm so <laughs> This is not a good time to ask about recharging because I yeah. have not found the capacity. I can't do mm. capacity building. Like I just don't, there's not enough physical space or time to recharge and there's nowhere to go to do it. So when I can get away, it's nature for sure. Um, I, you know, I just find traveling even so stressful in the United States. Obviously the airlines are going to collapse. That's amazing. So like nothing about that is like sexy as like fantasy scape for me any longer. Like the mm. practical rigmarole or getting from place a to, a to b is just like not workable at the moment so it's just nature unfortunately arkansas is beautiful and is full of tons of nature it's easy to get out and enjoy you know the lakes and the rivers and and hike here but um it's not a I, burnout is real and also the struggle is forever like that's the nature of human consciousness is that there is no respite from the struggle unless you completely check out which is unethical so you know i think it's important to rest and relax i've been really prioritizing sleep like as a as one thing that I can actually control, but it's not producing like 
rest, right? It's an opportunity for reflection. I can get up and do my day. But I think these exchanges for me are really life-giving and useful. And so mostly I've been trying to spend my time connecting with new people who don't come with all of the local baggage of their bullshit and their relationships and their grievances because it's like refreshing. Like we'll turn off the pod and you will go away and then I'll see you again at some point and it will be delightful again because we don't have all this bullshit history. Like it's going to weigh down our connection. So it's this sort of stuff I think right now that's regenerating me. I go back into the classroom in about a month. And so I think that will be helpful um, to see the students in person because of course nobody's going to do any social distancing ever again in the United States, I don't think. So I think it'll be nice to see them even through my mask. Um, I'm hopeful that that will recharge me a little bit, but we'll see. I'll keep you posted. Yeah. No worries. Well, and thank you. And thanks so much for, for doing this. Um, I really appreciate it. And just one more question. Is there a, I know that you mentioned music. Um, yeah. I, I try and like, I, I like records. It's one thing that I sort of escape with. Can you recommend an yeah. album that you sort of go to, or is there something that you grew up with that stuck with you? That was like, mm. you mentioned West coast rap or. Mm. Yeah. Sorry yeah. I go, back to, <laughs> I go back to the chronic all the time um, yeah. as like a defining album and easy, easy, easy does it. But as an adult, I've been, I've been able to see one show that was safe in person in the last two months. And I got to see Jason Isbell in, um, in Wichita, Kansas. I don't know. Have you listened? Do you know him? No, I don't. I'm going to be, I'll be YouTubing him after this. (laughs) Yeah, please do. I S B E L L Jason Isbell. Uh, he is, I think the best singer songwriter and just him and Brandy Carlyle are the best singer songwriters in the United States right now. I'll send you some of my favorite, uh, track southeastern is i think his best album and the show was amazing it was in the plains in wichita kansas right next to a railroad and the trains were coming by right next to the stage literally right next to it so his encore he played all of the train songs he knew and it was like such a rock out and it was so fun it was all open air and it was pretty small it was about half packed venue and it was just a really beautiful night and so i was reminded like the power of music i i you know that's one thing i've missed the most with the covid is sensibly going to shows and wilding out and listening to some new fresh tunes but man i'm uh, tomorrow night i'm going to go see big boy and run the jewels oh cool so yeah that's I'll let you know how that goes <laughs> yeah thanks <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh, that'll be amazing um yeah i love i got the recent album um lp and everything okay. yeah and the you know it just came at the right time when covid hit that recent album so i'm i'm pretty jealous so i'm looking <laughs> yeah i'll let you know how i mean i think it'll be interesting and i i would yeah. love to spend some time talking about killer mics like yeah. you know racial uh politics about capital because i've got a lot to say about that but yeah. mostly i'm just going to hear them rock out so i'll let you know how it goes i appreciate the invitation this has been a really lovely afternoon yeah uh, well thank you so much and yeah we will chat again um yes yeah and fingers crossed uh fingers crossed um killer mike plays reagan tomorrow night obviously i'm yeah. sure that they will i mean i don't know that i'll be able to live with myself if they don't so i have to hope that they will <laughs> okay I'll, I'll put it i'll put a video in the comments but uh yeah thank you so much and we will chat again soon and um yeah i hope you have a great day it's only it's still the morning there so enjoy the rest of your day yeah. thanks so much tim uh be in touch okay okay thanks <laughs>